Welcome back. Chapter 25 is called, I Strike the Jolly Roger. Okay, to strike a flag is to take it down. And Jolly Roger is a flag, the one we've talked about before, that is the flag that symbolizes the pirates. Okay, the Jolly Roger has been the flag that's been on the Hispaniola since it was um, abandoned by the captain and squire and the doctor, etc. Um, when Long John Silver's men took it over, they put up the Jolly Roger, and that's where it is. So if you're going to strike the Jolly Roger, you'd be on the Hispaniola, and you'd be taking down that flag. Okay? All right, so that's a good prediction for what might be happening next. Well, let's go ahead and give it um, a read. And uh, remember last we left Jim, he was um, hanging from the bowsprit of the Hispaniola because he just jumped up, and his little boat was crushed while he was trying to get on the Hispaniola. I had scarce gained a position on the bowsprit when the flying jib flapped and filled upon the other tack with a report like a gun. The schooner trembled to her keel under the reverse, but next moment the other sail still drawing the jib flapped back again and hung idle. This had nearly tossed me off into the sea, and now I lost no time, crawled back along the bowsprit and tumbled head foremost on the deck. Okay, remember the jib and its, uh, um, it is the, the triangular shape. Um, sail on the front of the ship, okay? All right, so he nearly gets knocked out, but knocked down, but anyway, he ends up on the ship. I was on the lee side of the forecastle and the mainsail, which it was still drawing, concealed from me a certain portion of the afterdeck. Not a soul was to be seen. The planks, which had not been swabbed since the mutiny, bore the print of many feet, and an empty bottle, broken by the neck, tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scuppers. The scuppers are like the gutters of a ship. They let the, the water that gets on the deck go out to sea, like, like the little openings out to sea, okay? So, and they kind of flap open and shut. Suddenly, the Hispaniola came right into the wind. The jibs behind me cracked aloud. The rudder slammed too. The whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder, and at the same moment, the main boom swung inboard the sheet groaning in the blocks, and showed me the lee after deck. Okay, there's two sides of the, the ship, the lee and starboard, okay? And um, then there's the stern and the bow, right? So look at your diagram if you still have it. Um, so you can kind of keep track of where everything is. But when the, the, the parts of the ship move, you can see in a different area, okay? There were the two watchmen. Sure enough, the red cap on his back, as stiff as a handspike, with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix, and his teeth showing through his open lips. Israel's hands propped against the bulwarks, his chin on his chest, his hands lying open before him on the deck, his face as white under its tan as a tallow candle. For a while, the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse, the sails filling now on one tack and now on another, and the boom swinging to and fro, till the mast groaned aloud under the strain. Now and again, too, there would come a cloud of light sprays over the bulwark, and a heavy blow of the ship's bow bows against the swell, so much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my homemade lopsided coracle, now gone into the bottom of the sea. So basically, the ship is just kind of being knocked around because it's not really organized to catch the wind and go in a particular direction. Everything is just kind of let loose. And because it's a big thing in kind of a mechanical operation, it gets jounced around a lot more than that little light little coracle that Jim had just been in. At every jump of the schooner, red cap slipped to and fro, but what was ghastly to behold, neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth disclosing grin was any way disturbed by this rough usage. At every jump, too, hands appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck, his feet sliding ever the farther out, and the whole body canting towards the stern so that his face became little by little hid from me, and at last I could see nothing beyond his ear and the frayed ringlet of one whisker. At the same time, I observed around both of them splashes of dark blood upon the planks and began to feel sure that they killed each other in their drunken wrath. While I was thus looking and wondering, in a calm moment, when the ship was still, Israel hands turned partly round and with a low moan writhed himself back to the position in which I had seen him first. The moan, which told of pain and deadly weakness and the way in which his jaw hung open, went right to my heart. But when I remembered the talk I had overheard from the apple barrel, all pity left me. So remember, Israel was one of the guys talking about wanting to kill everybody. So, no, not a guy you're going to like. 
I walked aft until I reached the main mast. Come aboard, Mr. Hands, I said ironically. He rolled his eyes round heavily, but he was too far gone to express surprise. All he could do was to utter one word, brandy. It occurred to me there was no time to lose, and dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck, I slipped aft and down the companion stairs into the cabin. It was such a scene of confusion as you could hardly fancy. All the lockfast places had been broken open in quest of the chart. The floor was thick with mud where ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp. The bulkheads, all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt, bore a pattern of dirty hands. Dozen of empty bottles clinked together in the corners in the rolling of the ship. One of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table. Half of the leaves got it out. I suppose for pipe lights. In the midst of all this, the lamp still cast a smoky glow, obscure and brown as umber. Basically, the pirates had trashed the cabin, which was kind of nice before, and not just gross and dirty. I went into the cellar. All the barrels were gone, and of the bottles, a most surprising number had been drunk out and, brown and thrown away. Certainly, since the mutiny began, not a man of them could have even been sober, sober ever been sober. So, of all the alcohol that was on board, they seemed to have been drinking it all. For foraging about, I found a bottle with some brandy left for hands, and for myself I routed out some biscuit and some pickled fruits and a great bunch of raisins and a piece of cheese. With these I came on deck, put down my own stock behind the rudder head, and well out of the cousin's reach, went forward to the water breaker and had a good deep drink of water, and then, and not till then, gave hands the brandy. He must have drunk a gill before he took the bottle from his mouth. Aye, said he, by thunder, but I wanted some of that. I had sat down already in my own corner and begun to eat. Much hurt, I asked him. He grunted, or rather I might say he barked. If that doctor was aboard, he said, I'd be right enough in a couple of turns, but I don't have no manner of luck, you see, and that's what's the matter with me. As for that swab, he's good and dead, he is, he added, indicating the man with the red cap. He weren't no seaman, anyhow, and where might you have come from? Well, said I, I've come aboard to take possession of this ship, Mr. Hands, and you'll please regard me as your captain until further notice. He looked at me sourly enough, but said nothing. Some of the color had come back into his cheeks, though he still looked very sick and still continued to slip out and settle down as the ship banged about. By the by, I continued, I can't have these colors, Mr. Hands, and by your leave, I'll strike them. Better none than these. And again, dodging the boom, I ran to the color lines handed down their cursed black flag and chucked it overboard. God save the king, said I, waving my cap, and there's an end to Captain Silver. He watched me keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. I reckon, he said at last, I reckon Captain Hawkins. You'll kind of want to get ashore now. Suppose we talks. Why, yes, says I, with all my heart, Mr. Hand, say on. And I went back to my meal with good appetite. This man, he began, nodding feebly at the corpse, O'Brien were his name, a rank islander, Irelander. This man and me got the canvas on her, meaning for to sell her back. Well, he's dead now, he is, as dead as bilge. And who's to sail this ship, I don't see. With that, I gives you a hint you ain't that man, as far as I can tell. Now look here, you gives me food and drink and an old scarf or anchature to tie my wound up. You do, and I'll tell you how to sail her. And that's about square all round, I take it. I'll tell you one thing, says I. I'm not going back to Captain Kidd's anchorage. I mean to get into North Inlet and beach her quietly there. To be sure you did, he cried. Why, well, ain't such an infernal lubber after all. I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling, I have, and I've lost. And it's you has the wind of me. North Inlet. Why, I haven't no choice, not I. I'd help you sail her up to execution dock by thunder, so I would. Well, as it seemed to me, there was some sense in this. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes, I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island with good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon and beating down again as far as North Inlet before high water when we might beach her safely and wait till the subsiding tide permitted us to land. Then I lashed the tiller. That's the thing that steers in the back so you can lash it into place. And went below to my own chest where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. With this and with my aid, hands bound up the great bleeding stab he had received in the thigh, and after he had eaten a little and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, began to pick up visibly, sit, sat straighter up, spoke louder and clearer, and looked in every way another man. The breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, 
the coast of the island flashing by and the view changing every minute. Soon we were past the high lands and bowling beside low sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines. And soon we were beyond that again and had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was greatly elated with my new command and pleased with the bright sunshiny weather and these different prospects of the coast. I had now plenty of water and good things to eat and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I had made. I should, I think, have had nothing left me to desire but for the eyes of the cousin as they followed me derisively about the deck and the odd smile that appeared continually on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness, a haggard old man's smile. But there was, besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery. In his expression, as he craftily watched and watched and watched me at my work. Okay, to go back and just quickly recap. Here he is. He sees that Israel Hands is on the deck. And he helps him a little because the man is injured. And Israel tells him that he'll help him. He'd help him sail to execution dock because he can't do it on his own. Neither of them can do it on their own. Jim wraps up his, his wound, gives him food, brandy, gets himself some water because he's not going to drink the brandy because he needs to be healthy right now. Takes down the pirate flag, throws it in the ocean. Done with that. And that's enough of Captain Silver, he says. And now he's Captain Hawkins, and Israel Hands is going to help him. Or is he? So they get it all settled and kind of sailing around the north side of the island. And they were under control with Hands helping Jim know what to do. Jim's kind of happy about it. He's kind of guilty because he ran away. But now he's like, I, I saved the ship. I took it from the pirates. This is good, right? But he has a problem. Because Israel Hands is kind of giving him this creepy smile. Makes him a little suspicious. Maybe there's something going on. All right, write about those two. And maybe you want to write about the other guy too. He may not be doing anything, but he's kind of significant because he's like dead. Okay, make sure you write about those three people. There's lots of vocabulary to discover in here. Stuff that I didn't explain that you can write down and figure it out, especially parts of a boat that might help you understand the story just a little bit better about what's happening. Okay. Uh, write about what you wonder, write, write about what's difficult, write a good summary so you have a good idea of it. Not a very complicated uh, chapter, but it's leading up to one called Israel Hands that we're going to really have fun discussing in the next one. All right, so I'll see you then.